Ready. All right, and we are live. And today we are with Mr. Antoine DeVoist. So how are you, Antoine? I'm good. Good to talk to you. Yeah, likewise, likewise. So I usually start with, uh, you know, where did we meet? When did we meet? Uh, I, if I had to maybe pick a time frame, what, like 2014? Decentral? Uh, yeah, I think Toronto? It was, I think it was 2014. <laughs> if not late 2013, but probably 2014, yeah. Okay, okay, okay. And uh, and yeah, Decentral. I don't know, maybe, maybe remind me, it must have been at Decentral, right? It was definitely a decentral, yeah. Definitely a decentral at one of the Bitcoin meetups. <laughs> yeah, I don't remember the first instance where we talked, um, but uh, one of the first. I remember you were giving presentations on Buttercoin. Um, uh huh. Uh huh. Snap every now and then, so uh, you were invited there to give a presentation on Buttercoin, and then we just like chilled in the group and talked afterwards. And yeah, that's that's kind of how it went at the meetups. People just get together, and sometimes there's like a small core group and. As people leave the meetup, it gets more and more concentrated as to like the who are the most passionate people left over. So <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh my goodness. That uh it takes me takes me back. Uh yeah, yeah, I miss those days. Those those were fun days. Uh I remember it was yeah. Anthony Diorio, right? That that had gotten that space. Uh yeah. it was like a house just in downtown Toronto. Yeah, we need that in Toronto. We need another house like that or a dedicated space. Right? Once this COVID thing's over. Yeah, uh, we'll get something yeah. like that together. But I, I remember that because it gave all all of us Bitcoiners a, a bit of a home or a home away from home, if you will. You know, where yeah. we could all Just a place to go to. Yeah, a place to go to. Yeah, yeah. Where everyone else is going exactly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I always talk about meetups and stuff like that, just because like I find like, you know, a lot of people wonder. It's like, well, how do you build, you know, businesses, or how do you, you know, um, like go after opportunities. Well, the answer is people, right? Like you need to be around other people. And so if you, one way to do that is to go to meetups. And I find they're fascinating because they're these people you've never met before, but as soon as you meet them, you feel like this instant connection, right? Because because you're you're passionate about the same thing. In our case, it was Bitcoin. Okay, so so I, I refer to Bitcoin as a bit of a singularity, you know, as as a, maybe as a self-proclaimed futurist. That that word probably resonates with you a bit more than others. But uh, but just uh, so let's maybe start with uh, you know I don't know I guess your life story, if you will, before uh, coming into the Bitcoin space, before launching Bitcoin ATMs, and you know doing all the crazy cool things you've been doing. Um, uh, what yeah what was your what what was your background look like just for for everyone to kind of know yeah. there's not too much to go into i mean it's just uh, okay so let's move on to the next I... one no i'm kidding <laughs> <laughs> yeah no uh well i was born in japan i grew up in the middle east i did school in, in bahrain and england and i came to canada to, to go to university nihongo desu ne yeah <laughs> yeah i speak i don't no, speak japanese not so much i used to when i was three years old fun fact but uh yeah not anymore but um yeah so i mean i was always interested in like technology and games and computers um i mean i guess you could probably say one of the uh well my singularity in my life if you're saying bitcoin's like a singularity was when I read about the singularity and I, I instantly read about it and I read about how when uh, you create uh, an intelligence that's greater than your, your own intelligence, then it can go on and create um, further intelligence that's greater than itself and so on and so forth. And I was like, immediately that makes sense. And then I became a singularitarian, I guess you would say. Um, like after the first time I read it. And then, uh, yeah, I mean, like in 2007, I was with my roommate and we were reading um, The Age of Spiritual Machines. And back in 2007, we were discussing with each other. Oh, I think, uh, pretty sure I'm going to be immortal. <laughs> yeah. That was back in 2007. So even then you could see like, you know, look and, and, and extrapolate from, from um, accelerating returns, you know. Um, technology just building on top of itself and, get, and and improving faster and faster. And and knowing that within our lifetimes, we would see such great advances that we could, you know, this concept of immortality, that you, medicine moves so fast that that you're able to, um, 
like increase your life expectancy faster than one year per year. So. Yeah, I'm, I'm a big fan of that. In fact, that's, that's one thing I, I kind of talk about every now and then too, is, uh, is this idea of, uh, <clears throat> of, yeah, of like living yeah, forever, you know, uh, some people think it's possible. There was just, have you ever heard of a guy named Aubrey yeah, de Grey? He's like, got like a big beard, much bigger story. than yours. So um, it was at EdCon in Toronto. He was invited to okay, speak okay. there. And I got like the amazing chance to talk to him. And I was like, you know, one of the things I keep saying um, to people I'm inspired by you is uh, the first thousand year old will be born 15 years later than the first 150 year old. I think, it, I think that's the, number, the, the, the quote. So basically um, the first 150 year old might be born in like 1920 or something, right? But the first hundred year old would be born in like 1935. Sorry, the first thousand year old will be born in 1935. I'm just saying um, examples. I, I don't have the exact numbers, um, but do you get what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then he said, you know, it's even crazier. If you extrapolate that further, extrapolate that further, the first million year old will be born two years later than the first thousand year old. <laughs> and I was like, what? <laughs> Yeah, and then, um, yeah, I mean, that's, that's just, you know, extrapolating the math given certain assumptions. But Aubrey, so, Aubrey de Grey talks more about, like, the, our biological kind of, like, uh, or, or the ability to use biotech, rather, to, to reverse or to stop the aging cycle. But is he, is he also going into the realm of, like, crazy land of, like, backing up uh, our, no, our cells? No, he's not doing and, that. And like nanotechnology. Anyways, okay, Antoine, you know what? Let's listen. We're, we're kind of pretending like we're just talking normally here and going off on tangents. Let's stick yeah. to your story. So where, where, so you grew up in uh, in the Middle East. You tra- you traveled a lot, a lot, right? Like your your parents, your family, um, your dad's like in the oil industry, I think, or something like that. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. yeah, okay. And then and then what? Yeah. And then in terms of like after school, after univer- after high school and stuff, were you more into like technical stuff? Yeah, I was, were you more I was into, into like math, business things? Technical stuff. Um, I'm super interested in math. Theory. Okay. I love number theory, probabilities. Uh, I always try to think in terms of probabilities and do probabilistic reasoning. Um, and uh, so yeah, I, I just love I love math. I love physics, and um, and I got into computer programming as well. So I, I, programming is kind of up my alley. I only learned to program when I was 18 years old, but um, I've been doing it since then. Uh, yeah, I mean, and uh, like I said, it's kind of like a, a normal life. <laughs> There's not really too much that interesting, except for my, my background of where I'm from and I grew up, grew up in all these different places. Yeah, but you, you know, now that I'm doing these episodes or whatever, I'm, I think you, this will be like episode number 20 or something, yeah. right? But uh, which is just a start, but still, um, I've noticed some patterns though, is like a lot of early Bitcoin adopters, if you will, tend to be people who are um, fairly technical or they have like some, you know, affinity towards like computers yeah, yeah. and, and I mean, programming. Yeah which it seems like is a case for you. And the second thing is, is also, um, which I've seen a strong, uh, like kind of slant towards, which is um, like a global view as well, right? Uh, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, well, you... that, that describes it really well. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, mm-hmm. I, mean, I was born... mm-hmm. Okay, so take us into, take us into, I guess, I mean, segue into like, I guess, Bitcoin in terms of like, when did you, when did you come across it first? Was it that same guy you were reading well, the Singularity with? The global view, I just want to, uh, say one thing. So I, I was born in Japan. My dad was born in um, Belgian Congo. And my grandfather was born in China. <laughs> so yeah, pretty cool. But anyways, about yeah, so let's let's talk about crypto. Ni hao ma? No, uh, that's that's all. Sorry. <laughs> Okay. Okay. Yes. Does that, that's fascinating. I did not yeah. know about that, that your yeah. grandfather's from, so are you partially Chinese? Uh, no, <laughs> not really. But they're of descent from where? Oh, Belgium. My, like my grandfather's from Belgium. Belgium. Yeah. Okay. 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 So you're like a mix of a whole bunch of interesting places. Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> or like your, at least your family's been to. Okay. So, and did you, were you, and you also did, um, What's it called, right? Like homeschooling or private schooling or what uh, was it? Yeah, homeschooling. I mean, um, I one of the cool things that I look back and I'm something I was able to do with homeschooling um, 
is uh, when we did math lessons, I was just like really lazy um, when it comes to writing. So I just hated writing out math problems. So I would just do them all in my head. Um, maybe in the regular school system that wouldn't have been tolerated as well. But <laughs> I mean, when my mom was teaching me math, she kind of just let me do it out of exa exasperation. So I became really, really good at mental math. Uh, 232 times 12. Um, 1,320, 1,500, and uh, 84. <laughs> Actually, that's right. That's correct. Good job. I figured it out like five seconds ago, but good job. No, I'm uh, kidding. I have no idea. <laughs> okay, good job. Yeah. <laughs> Let's continue. Okay, Antoine. Um, okay, so keep going. Keep going. How did Bitcoin? You like math? You're a geek? Uh, yeah, so I'm talking about crypto, like um, about Bitcoin, rather. Uh, when I went online, um, I think I saw it because I was exploring the, the deep web, the mysterious deep web, and I just downloaded Tor and I went on there and I saw this Bitcoin symbol. And I didn't pay too much attention to it. I was like, hmm, you know, mildly interesting. And what then, year is this? 20, when you said, sorry, 2010? 2011, probably. Um, 2011, right. Yeah. But later I saw, you know, some friends talking about it on Facebook. Um, and I investigated it more. And then I really got interested in it. I saw the 21 million Bitcoin limit. And I thought to myself, if Bitcoin could be used uh, in place of credit card payments, right, then that alone would cause the value of it to skyrocket, given that it's limited in um, uh, supply. So that was like my first thought towards Bitcoin is like it could just be used for online payments. Obviously there's much more to it than that, but uh, I, I thought that just that fact alone, plus the fact of the limited supply of 21 million ever uh, meant that the value must skyrocket in the future. So I went and I bought some um, and I watched the value go from up from like $2 to $1,000. Uh, a lot of, lot of stories happening in between. Then I got gawked. Are we gonna go into those? Yeah, sure. I have <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I made I made like seventeen bitcoins from a, a Ponzi scheme. Uh, oh wait, let's not talk mind. about those. I was talking not about. I'm kidding. I, I, didn't, I accidentally made that money. Like I didn't know it was a Ponzi scheme. I put I put like a bunch of bitcoin in there, hmm. and uh, realized it was a, a scam, and then withdrew it. But then I still got like money bitcoins from all the other people depositing in there. And, and yeah, hey Antoine, I'm just gonna pause it for a second. All right, we're back. Yeah, continue. Uh, yeah, so so stories. I mean, I once um, gave accidentally, well, not accidentally, but I, I once uh, withdrew uh, 900 extra Bitcoins from CA Vertex. Um, they had a bug in there, you know, and then I just withdrew again and again, and it just sent me multiple transactions. And at the end of the month, the CEO or uh, the CEO called me and he said, um, do you remember withdrawing all these Bitcoins from your account? And I was like, yeah, I did it. And then I ended up sending them back. Kind of regret doing that now that Saber Texas is no longer operational. But... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Okay, that's that's pretty funny. So yeah. nine hundred bitcoins that Sea Vertex accidentally sent you yeah. that you gave back. That's yeah. nice to know. Any other interesting stories with exchanges? Um, yeah, it's there. There is a couple stories um, that I wouldn't share for privacy reasons. Mm. Uh, tell my close friends. But um, what else? No, I mean just just the craziness of of buying Bitcoin like two dollars and watching it go to a thousand and then crashing and then going up way higher. Um, it's, it's just been like a wild ride. And so, so Antoine, so before you got, I was gonna say before you got into Bitcoin, then just to sum up global citizen, you know, somewhat of a technical lens, you had this kind of futurist kind of, you yeah. know, element exactly. uh, to your to your history. And then and then you come across Bitcoin and you're like, OK, um, well, it's limited, I, super exciting. And it's like it's going to it's going to solve online payments, which is obviously that was just one thing I thought of massive. Like, yeah. yeah. OK, so what how, so what I'm just curious, like what like what happened? It says you're interested in Bitcoin like what did you do like did you like did you i don't know did you go into like hibernation for three months did you go to meetups like how did you end up like kind of you know building on that like before you got into like all this like whatever exchange stuff like what I mean, like how did you i mean uh we uh got together with some friends and we used some of the, the bitcoin that i had to buy a uh, bitcoin atm 
and we launched Toronto's second Bitcoin ATM. You launched Toronto's second Bitcoin ATM. Yeah, that was, I, Very important. So what was that? Uh, what was that called? What was that experience like? Uh, Bumblebee Exchange. We actually Bumblebee Exchange. I remember it. Uh, story, story to it. Like we we launched in um, Snakes and Lattes. You gotta speak a little uh, bit louder, I think, man. Yeah, sorry. Uh, we launched in Snakes and Lattes. Snakes and Lattes is a very form- famous uh, board game cafe in Toronto, and um, they kind of uh, became our uh, angel investor, not with money, but with retail space. Uh, so they let us put their our ATM in there. Um, and uh, yeah, there, there was it was kind of successful in some ways, but uh, in the end, uh, it was it was a bad match because we had we had like uh, drug dealers using it, and they didn't really appreciate uh, drug dealers coming in, not giving a fuck about their space, and just okay. Uh, and if something didn't work, they uh, would, you know, get angry at the wrong people. Um, at the staff, you know, because the staff were there all the time. I wasn't there hundred percent of the time. Um, and not only that, but uh, there were some incidences at like two in the morning where uh, they, they reported that these people, uh, they wanted to use the ATM, but they were closing shop. So they were like bang at the door at two in the morning. He's like, let us in to use the ATM. So we want to use the ATM and, and uh, that, that they really didn't appreciate that. So uh, they basically, uh, um, ended our agreement and we had to move out of there. Uh, I still have the ATM in storage, never ended up setting it up again, but. Um, but, but imagine if you were a, a store owner and you had customers that were literally banging at your window yeah, wanting no, to get not in. Not all the customers. I mean, it, I'm just saying. <laughs> no, 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 I know. Probably a super yeah. sketchy set. Uh, exactly. <laughs> Guys looking like you. <laughs> uh, okay, interesting. So yeah. some challenges there um, with yeah. the store owners that what happened, you guys got the boot? I mean, essentially, yeah, at least all friendly and everything. But... And then what now with the machine set up in your basement? <laughs> it's just in storage. <laughs> in storage, okay. Yeah, it's still viable. Like the, the, the actual machine is, is still usable. Um, you just have to update the software. Uh, the software needs up- updating, but the machine itself is still usable. Mm. <clears throat> yeah, I should probably, I was just gonna, I was just gonna just probably say something. It's probably worth noting that, uh, that you and I know each other quite well, right? You're like, uh, if I was Joe Rogan, you're like Jamie or vice versa. <laughs> yeah, you can become like Joe Rogan if you keep doing uh, these podcasts every, you know. Yeah, yeah. Because like I'm being like super sarcastic and as if they were like just chatting. But, um, you know, that, that I was going to say that's another quality of Canadians that I've noticed that. Yeah, um, you know what? I'm just going to come out and give you like a really good exclusive uh, story for exclusive for the Sunny Ratio. I've never come out with this in public before. Um, yeah, you haven't, you only have like 50 views on each of your videos right now. So I imagine- it's Hey, only- 500 on the Max Kaiser one, 500 right, views, right. okay. But nonetheless, I, for my video, I imagine that um, it'll be a while before it sort of disseminates. But um, here, here's the thing. Oh, you're gonna drop a bomb? I'm gonna drop a bomb. Um, oh my God, can you get close to the mic? Here, I'll just mute maybe myself. Maybe I'll become famous for it later, I don't know. But, um, and I have, I have proof for this. I was the individual who pushed Bitcoin above a thousand dollars for the first time on on Mt. Gox. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So there was a there was a there was a cell wall. This is um, in 2014, uh, and and you know there's a cell wall, and I I just had sold Bitcoin before, right? So I had a bunch of dollars on Mt. Gox, and there was a cell wall on Mt. Gox and I just bought the cell wall. So I literally pushed the price of Bitcoin above $1,000 for the first time. Now that's not like technically completely accurate because Bitcoin had already reached $1,000 on the Chinese exchanges. But um, on Mt. Gox, which is what all the Western media and all the Western um, observers would have been interested at the time, um, I pushed Bitcoin above $1,000. And that same day I saw a BBC article. I can find it for you actually. A BBC article that said that Bitcoin had reached a thousand dollars, and uh, yeah, that was that was kind of surreal to see that, and then just be like, it was like I did that. <laughs> I have I have proof from the um, I downloaded um, uh, uh, trade trading data from my Mt. Gox account. So I have that. On my That's an amazing story. How, how did that Mt. Gox story turn out for you? Well, obviously not so well. I think I'm. 
<laughs> and I got caught. But you know, I'm gonna get some of that back. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, no, but yeah. <laughs> so one of my favorite uh, sayings is uh success matters, failure is inconsequential. That's what you know, yeah, you know no, Kosla, that's a great, like a Kosla. wise saying. I mean and you exemplify this quote more than anyone. Don't, don't remember your failures. They remember your successes. I I always now that it's encoded in YouTube, we'll uh, hopefully always remember your failures. Right. Right. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. No, but I think it's important to be able to like own your failures too, right? You know what I mean? Like yep. uh, to be proud of them because as long as you're not like making the same mistake over and over again, hopefully, you know, you're learning from them or whatever. Well, um, any lessons actually, like uh, from that, oh, you know, lesson, painful experience I mean, with cool. Mount Cox, like for others, like listening, like, would you say your, your main like, message is like what? My like main message is hodl and not hodl. But how does that look like hodl on exchanges? No. <laughs> you know, the answer to that. Well, uh, so I'm trying yeah, to get it to. It looks like hodling in your own wallets that you control, where you control the private keys. Yeah, I mean, I, but, but you know that that word control i wonder if i don't think most people even understand what that means like when you have your bitcoin let, let's say you have your money in a bank you control that money kind of sort of you, you technically don't well, when because, you control cryptocurrency but, um yeah so like what is it like when you have your money on an exchange aren't you not essentially you know basically you um you have or you know you know a certain um string of numbers and digits um, like mathematically speaking, you just know a certain very large number that proves, um, or that, that gives you the ability to, um, um, sign transactions in, and, uh, that, uh, it's, it's basically, you, you, you know, a number that proves that you own Bitcoin and you can use that proof to, to, uh, send the Bitcoin to other addresses. Mm. So like an alphanumeric, how many characters is it? I forget, 20. Yeah, it's not um, numeric, a hexadecimal number, but it's, it's at the end of the day, it's just a number, right? You know, mm. it's ring. I don't know if I have to look it up, but it's a very, very large number. Let's leave it at that. And so the key is to hold your own keys, right? At the end yeah. of the day. And then uh, maybe a treasure, no. maybe a open die, no, what is it called? Cold card or, you know, uh, oh, or maybe even a paper down. wallet. Yeah, write it down. Like, but you should you should own your private keys. It's a little bit you know convoluted, but okay. Let's get back to your story, man. So what? Okay, so you 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 do this machine. You you mess around with Mt. Gox. You have this experience with CA Vertex, you know. And so where does this all eventually? I don't know. Take you like? Uh, well, um, I'm working on um, some cryptocurrency projects. Um, I'm very focused on creating my own currencies right now. <clears throat> so we're gonna try and do that and sounds see. scammy what are you talking about i mean bitcoin is a currency that was created is that so are you, are you talking about like ant coin or something like antoine coin what are we talking about here um uh, well you're, you're not uh, selling me on it i'm, I'm not i'm not trying <laughs> to <laughs> creating um uh, uh dev cash dev cash okay tell us about dev cash what's the goal behind forget the coin part like what are you trying to do yeah we're trying to create cash for a developer economy Let's and why can't developers use normal cash? Well, we we want to uh, bootstrap our like our own ecosystem, right? And I want to pay developers bounties to help me build Dev Cash and all of the platforms and all of the um, the the uses and all of the services and everything. Um, now, if I wanted to pay bounties in Ethereum, right, I can't do that because I don't have any Ethereum. If I want to pay bounties in Bitcoin, I can't do that because I don't have Bitcoin. But I created Dev Cash. So I have a ton of DevCash. So anyone who's interested in, in helping me with DevCash can- Okay, so let's say I'm one of those developers. I come help you. Yeah. You give me some of this DevCash. Yeah. It's not worth anything. You just said, so what am I going to, how am I going to pay well, for well, rent or for mortgage or for my kids? Well, you're not, you're not meant to pay, use it to pay rent, by the way. The, the, the thing is, is that you're doing speculative work and, and, and trying to earn a currency that may be worth much more in the future. So it's the same rationale when you're buying crypto, right? Like, yeah, you'd be very smart to buy Bitcoin at, at 30 cents in 2010. Uh, you could have asked all those same questions. But um, I mean, the reality is anyone who did that made out like a bandit. But uh, so- instead Who of what? Bitcoin, made out? Oh, you mean like the bet on Bitcoin paid off, but yeah, you're right. saying the bet on yeah. Antoine coin will also pay off because yeah, so Bitcoin paid off. Instead of putting your money in, right? 
and doing a speculative investment. You put your work in and do speculative work. Mm, I like that in one way, in the sense that you're not asking people for their money. Yeah. You're asking them for their time, but still time is money. And, but well, you're giving well, them some saying, token that, that you hope, or they hope that you and they right. hope will go up in value. Well, what, I, I just, I mean, you well, knew, you know, I mean, you, you and I are friends. I've always had a hard time getting my head around the, draw an the whole ICO here. thing, but yeah, I'm I'm sorry. An analogy here that if, if you think that there's, there's ways that you can um, benefit from speculative investment, right? And you have all these arguments for and against speculative investments, of course, then you can definitely uh, benefit from speculative work as well. In fact, it's even like better because you're not putting money in, you're putting in time and effort. But there is, but I don't know exactly, I'm not a lawyer, but aren't there some rules around like, if somebody does work for you, you got to pay them? Like, because I've, I've, I've been in like job interviews where I was like, I'll work for you for free. I just love your company. And later on, I found out that you can't actually like, like you can say that if you want, but most companies aren't legally allowed to like hire you and not pay you anything. So have you looked into the legalities of, of that? Well, I mean, I don't see that there'd be too many problems because everyone's just um, doing it voluntarily. And, and also there's no company, it's just a decentralized network. So I'm not, they're not really working for me. They're working for the ecosystem. Mm -hmm. Oh, so they can like build dApps, kind of similar to Ethereum. Anyway, yeah, so you, you're yeah. working on a new, I guess you could say your, your uh, project where you want to incentivize devs, developers to yeah, so create I'm, an I'm, ecosystem. I'm, but I'm just wondering like, how, like developers for what though? Like, are they developers for what? Like, well, right now, like usually like, 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 I mean, like there's, there's, as, hmm. it's, starting off, uh, it's starting off as blockchain developers. So we're going to create um, like educational um, uh, sort of pathways where we have a bunch of tutorials so people can learn how to become blockchain developers. And then we're going to take companies and we're going to we're going to say, hey, we'll match you up with these developers for a fee. You, you know, as well as I do, how in demand blockchain developers can be. True. So that's one of the things we want to do is we want to train people up. And then Please, say, say I'm a company. Okay. Yeah. Like right now, actually, I, I do know of companies and some that I'm really close to that are looking for Solidity developers. Okay. Yeah. So we want a Solidity developer. Like yeah. normally the company would be like, okay, let's look on, I don't know, angel list. Let's list on LinkedIn. Let's check in our networks. Let's put out a job post. Let's hire somebody with those skill sets. Yeah. Where does dev cash fit into the mix? Well, we, um, we can just set up, um, like a system where where those people essentially pay to get access to the developers in one way or another, right? So maybe pay per interview or or they they pay part of their salary. So like like have you ever used like Freelancer or Upwork or any of those websites? Like they no. enable me to hire someone to program for me and pay, yeah, and pay and them, pay right? Me, right. So that's so here they would be I could get developers for free because they'd work for DevCash. Yeah, I don't have the exact model um, decided yet, but. No, okay, anyway, so it, I think it's it's interesting. It's an interesting idea. Maybe we need to iterate on it a bit. But okay, so let's let's move on to maybe the next topic real quick. So what is um like you know Peter Thiel's kind of like famous question like what is one truth that you hold that you think most other let's say Bitcoiners would disagree with you on? Uh, well, I have <laughs> yeah, I have I have two. Um, mm. Mm, I guess we'll start with the they're both controversial in in the in. Even especially the Bitcoin space, just like you. So the first one is <laughs> the first one is um, Bitcoin is not. I don't believe that. I believe that Bitcoin is not the be all and end all, and that um, there will be many many currencies uh, that will that are being created and that will be created in the future and that will gain tons of value. Um, uh, there's this thing people follow called the uh, the Bitcoin dominance percentage, right? So right now, Bitcoin is worth 65% of the total market cap. My prediction is that's going to go down as many more cryptocurrencies are generated, right? A lot of people talk about wealth transfer when the price of crypto is going up. But I, I actually think it's not wealth transfer that's going on. It's wealth creation. Because when you create a crypto and the price goes up, you're actually creating new wealth or um, new perceived wealth that people believe, all the holders of those cryptocurrencies believe that their wealth is going up, right? So that to me, that's wealth creation, or at least 
um, if we're going to be really specific, perhaps the creation of perceived wealth, right? So if I have, you know, Ethereum, it's like a million people who hold Ethereum or whatever, and the price of Ethereum goes up, then all those million people, they all think that their, uh, their wealth is increasing, right? So that's a bunch of creation of perceived wealth. And the reason I say that is because if I go and buy like a billion dollars worth of Ethereum, it's going to increase the market cap of Ethereum by far more than a billion dollars, right? So I could take a billion dollars and generate, I don't know, um, I'm just guessing here, but a hundred billion dollars worth of perceived wealth or $50 billion worth of perceived wealth. But that only took a billion dollars, right? And also that billion dollars didn't go anywhere. It went into someone else's hands. So you just transferred $1 billion from you to other people. And then that act increases the perceived wealth of all Ethereum holders by like 30 to 50 billion or something. Do you get what I'm saying? What is the contrarian belief? If you had to sum it up in a sentence or two? Okay, my contrarian belief is that um, the Bitcoin dom dominance will, will decrease drastically over time. So right now it's 65%. And you, you, you have believed this since like four years ago or five years ago, right? Like yeah. since we, we, you and I have been talking about this and, and we obviously agree to disagree on this and, and Bitcoin has done nothing but hold it's like 70% like lion like well, dominance. I mean, listen, like in, in, in uh, July in, in 2013, it was at 90%, right? So it's gone down since then. Yeah. I mean, people are allowed to make mistakes. In 2016, 2017, it was like 80, 90%. So since then, it's gone down, and I believe it's uh, it's gone all the way down to like 35%. <laughs> what is it at right now? 65. 65%. Yeah. 10 years in, 65%. Let yeah. that sink in. I mean, that is... And and I mean, at least when I hear about the PayPal's and the wealth simples and the micro strategies and the route yeah, calls... There and you the go. That's, that's what I say. I say the, the, the total value of all crypto is going to far outstripped the value of Bitcoin, in my opinion. In the total, okay, okay. Yeah, well, the total value of crypto will outstrip the total value of Bitcoin. Yes, that's already happening because it's only 65 or 35%. But your bet is if you had to pick up, make a hardcore kind of like call, you'd say like Bitcoin dominance will shrink to fill in the blank. I, I don't know. Um, percentage. Like it's definitely like, I definitely definitely think it'll go below 20. Um, in what time below. frame? That's really hard to predict. And you um, said that five years ago when we first met, and it's yeah, yeah, still yeah. not at twenty. I don't know what the time frame is. So uh, the time frame. Smart, smart. Just leave the time frame open ended. Therefore, you're never right or wrong. Well, I let's like say that. like at least within the next twenty years. I'll just put it super wide. But... Ooh, okay, okay. Old enough to not remember. <laughs> I'm just playing. Okay, Adwan, what's what's next? What's next? What's next? Okay, okay so you said you have two contrarian beliefs, though. Yeah, you have two. One. Okay, uh, two for the price of one. Is that um, there's an ever so slight chance that uh, Bitcoin might end up being a bubble. So that's that's contrarian among Bitcoiners. It's Bitcoiners, not, okay. No, it's okay. not contrarian among like the general population because. But okay, look, I'll, I'll give you some um, uh, some some reasoning to back up what what I'm saying. Uh, so I mean, if you go to, on Wikipedia, there's an article called "Cryptocurrency Bubble," uh, and on there it says that uh, Bitcoin is being characterized as a speculative bubble by eight winners of the Nobel Memorial Prize in Economic Sciences. So that means eight Nobel Pri Prize winners has have, have at least um, said that Bitcoin shares many characteristics with speculative bubbles. Um, oh, so so you're saying experts are claiming that Bitcoin might die? I'm not saying that all of those those. Um, <clears throat> I, I, that's not what I'm saying. I'm I'm, I'm saying that that um, a lot of experts, or let's just say eight Nobel Prize winners in economics, have at least stated that Bitcoin shares many characteristics with speculative bubbles. So. They're not saying they're not all saying it's definitely a bubble. What they're saying is, it looks like a bubble, it smells like a bubble, etc. But they're not saying they have not. Some of them have outright said it's a bubble, but some yeah, no, no. What I'm saying is like eight. Okay, great Nobel Prize winner. But I mean, like, how many times have have like other experts as well called yeah, also, like, the Bitcoin will die and it shall die and it will so, never so survive? Uh, Andreas Antonopoulos actually has come out and said Bitcoin's a bubble, 
Um, so. Oh, by the way, I don't disagree with that statement. I mean, yeah. in the sense that I do think Bitcoin goes through phases of like bubble like behavior. For example, yeah. like FOMO does exist and there are, you know, three, four distinct time periods of time I can think of over the last eight years where yeah. it went berserk. And yeah, and it was way overpriced. And you could tell because you're like, friend from grade three was calling you and being like whoa this bitcoin thing i'm going all in like <laughs> you know and so you knew that it was obviously a scary time um so yeah so i don't disagree but i also would agree that bubbles are not always bad there was a bubble during the railroad time right there was a bubble during the internet time mm -hmm. and so bubbles yeah. come and go but yeah. like what oh, what what lives in the wake of these bubbles like you know, in, in the case of, let's say, Amazon or whatever, you know, you know, the whole but, kind but, of narrative but, around here, that. Here's uh, something um, that might be good to realize. Uh, you can have all of these things be true. Like the technology might be super useful. Um, there might be tons of innovation. There might be tons of people work on it, working on it, all of these things. Um, and yet it's still a bubble, even after all of that. Yeah, true. Yeah. And what's the most fascinating thing about Bitcoin? I know you're a little bit of an Ether head. Yeah, I know you love yeah, Ether. Yeah. But like, what, what is it about Bitcoin that originally, I guess, like, you know, that still like amazes you? So the well, limited number, most, you said it. The hmm? most fascinating thing about Bitcoin to me was um, that it was the first of its kind and that it still exists and is still going strong. Like, I can't really think of many examples of that in other industries, you know. Like, I don't think the first car was very successful. <laughs> Do you know what a unit step function is? You said you're into math and stuff, right? Um, Have you heard of a unit? It's like when yeah. you go from zero to one, where it's like you're at the line that like treads zero oh, and then it goes yeah, to yeah. one. Yeah, discrete. Um, discrete um, to me, that's like kind of what Bitcoin represented, like similar to what you said, is like it was kind of a first yeah, of no, its kind. It like broke away from the pack. It took so many like super innovative and cool ideas, brought them together and like, yeah. you know, yeah, and solved true. like, that's serious true. math problems and anyway so um and everything after it as well has felt like just kind of a movement along one for me like i haven't seen you know that type of and that's why i'm just like so focused on on bitcoin i think it's super cool okay uh what about the same so wait did you share your second you did right your second uh contrarian yeah. belief among, yeah you did that you said okay what about now the last well i mean we can go as many questions as you want here but the one of my last big questions is around like what contrarian belief you hold as it applies to the rest of the world outside of Bitcoin blockchain. Yeah. And, and I think you kind of touched on one, which was like the longevity, right? Like, uh, oh, but, but any other crazy yeah. things or if you want to well, talk about well, that I one? I go like one level deeper because all those beliefs I, I, I hold about um, the singularity and, and the future of technology and the future of evolution. Um, I can go one step further because I, 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 I harbor um, a sort of conviction that even um, other singularitarians might not agree with. Um, and that is that the, the most, um, okay, maybe it's more of a personal uh, sort of preference, but the most exciting thing to me about um, the, the crazy technology that we've seen and that's just gonna increase is, is not, it's not AI. Um, it's actually the ability to um, use uh, technology in partnership with your own intelligence and your own body. So essentially becoming a cyborg. And I think that to me, becoming a cyborg is a lot more interesting than um, AI developments. And, and you can actually use AI and, and work with it, right? Human AI partnerships. And to me, human AI, partnerships is is more interesting than just ai alone um so that, yeah, that did you hear about elon musk's new neural link neural link following yeah. that yeah? yeah is that like right up kind of that that alley in terms of what you're talking about uh yeah um mm. uh, i'd have to do more research on it but um uh yeah actually in, in a sense it, it must be because the neural link allows you to output um signals right at a lot faster rate so that's, that's hey Antoine, have you been following OpenAI, GPT three? Uh, a little bit, yeah, and yeah, that's great to use AI. Um, and and as one example of of um, cyborgs being interesting, is that uh, there's this thing 
called Cyborg Chess, um, which was, and, and basically it's the idea that you have chess players and you have computers and the computers obviously they beat the chess players now, but it's still possible to beat computers um, if you team up with a computer. So human plus computer can still beat computers. And it was the case back in 2015 that even an average player with an average AI could still beat a really good AI. Um, now the AIs have increased more, so it's a little bit harder. But I'll put this put this to you. Um, how could an AI human team be worse than an AI? You could because at the very least, uh, you would be just as good as, as the AI because you would just uh, do nothing, right? So you can't. You know what you haven't thought about? A team of AIs. Well, how about a team of AIs and humans as well? <laughs> Yeah, what about a team of a thousand AIs? No, I'm kidding. Okay, okay. No, no, I, I see where you're going. Um, I, yeah. I, I know. I, I think you're onto something. I think the word cyborg carries a lot of like, ugh, yeah, like weird weird weirdness. Um, exactly. Yeah, but yeah. but I mean, if yeah, I mean, I I I, I yeah, I do believe that it's something that uh, yeah, may or may, and it won't happen with like people like you and me and just like people. It'll be like, oh my God, John got in a massive car accident. He's 35 years know, old. He's lost 10% yeah. of his brain. And we have the technology to make him, you know, normal again. And then in 10% of his brain will be, you know, a computer. And John will come out and he will look and sound and feel and talk just like John did before. Um, but then they'll call him back and they'll be like, oh, now we've got to change it to 20%. And then he'll still look and feel and and then at one day he'll come home and he'll be like, yep, a hundred percent of my brain has been, you know, transplanted into this, uh, you know, whatever. <laughs> and then the question is, is will John still be John? He'll still look and sound and talk the same, but anyways, I yeah. think we're kind of the, going off the, on a weird tangent. The ancient freaky. Uh, uh, I think it's called the toy boat paradox. It's like, you know, when you take a piece of the boat and you replace it with another one, at what point does it become a new boat? If you do mm. Pieces of the boat and, and replace it with new ones. But uh, here's here's another one. Uh, what if what if someone loses both their legs in a car accident, and then they get prosthetics? But it turns out the prosthetics are actually better than their original legs, and now they can run faster, they can jump higher. Can you imagine that? Like you have, imagine you have a friend who uh, loses their tragically loses um, their limbs in a car, mm. accident, and then they get prosthetic limbs, mm. which. Um, by most reasonable measures are better than the original ones. Mm -hmm. Stronger, faster, more precise even. Yeah, and it'll happen. It'll happen at the edges. Yeah. And then and then after John and Rebecca are like jumping higher and thinking faster and blah, 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 you'll have like a set of super wealthy people that are like, I want that, you know, and, and then they'll yeah. insert Neuralink and then they'll, you know, and so I don't, I don't necessarily, I'm not necessarily advocating for it or am I saying I look forward to that, but I've thought about this a lot and here's something else to consider. Um, removable um, enhancements, right? So instead of implanting it directly into your body and having it being invasive, you have like uh, some kind of computer chip, right? You can have a computer chip. And maybe it could look like this. Yeah. Ah. I mean, is it this it? Is it this kind of that? Like, I yeah, mean, it, yeah, it's yeah. as close to me as anything. Like, yeah. you know, it's it like, uh, um, but you know, I'm also a big fan of like, like not, you know, using technology, like just being human as well. So I hope there can be a, a place for just like normal humans in the future. Cause I, I definitely, I like these conversations, but they always, always kind of like, I get like matrix, you know, kind of like, there is like a, a sort of, of a, a division that you can, you can talk about. And, and that is, there's, there's three different things. One, just humans being humans, okay? Just regular humans, no enhancements, nothing. Um, two is just AI, artificial intelligence. Um, so those are two different things. But then you have the in-between one where a human might use technology to enhance themselves. And that's where you get the, the cyborg, which is uh, sort of a third option, right? So like augmented of, reality yeah, exactly. versus just like virtual reality yeah, type same. of thing, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, I'm, I'm all for it. I, I actually spent eight, you know this, I think, eight years in robotics prior to coming into Bitcoin. And so I've seen a lot of interesting things. Let's leave it at that. 
Um, okay, Antoine. So the 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 what was the, what was the final kind of controversial or whatever you know uh, contrarian belief, well, if you will, I, I, that for me, it's just basically that cyborgs um, are is more interesting than AI. cyborgs will will happen. Okay, but, but, <laughs> and, and cyborgs are more interesting than AI to me. And did you tell everyone that you are a cyborg? Uh, yeah, no, oh, wait, no, we're not supposed to say that. That's right. Government I'm, said I'm to keep that under wraps. Sorry, I'm a cyborg. And, uh, uh, you are a yeah. cyborg. Okay, more AI than human. <laughs> According to my definition, so are you. You're a cyborg too. Uh, oh, man, people are going to think this uh, interview is quite weird. Um, but it's okay. Uh, <laughs> um, okay, so, okay. Actually, my, my believe it or not, I have like these other kind of extraneous questions, which oddly enough, we covered at the beginning of this interview, which were like things about longevity and AI. And oh, oh, oh I do have one topic that I think you might opine upon, which is uh, Ubi. Oh, yeah. So with this onslaught of, you know, technology oh, yeah, and yeah. people getting replaced and jobs being replaced and the pandemic and the this and the yeah. that. Where does Ubi belong? And, and let, me, let me preface it by saying this, is I think a lot of us already recognize that, yes, the way Ubi normally is thought of, government's printing money and like blah, 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 giving it to everyone. Mm, okay, but that doesn't sit super well with maybe Bitcoiners, right? Like in terms of, uh, yeah. So I, I always, I think about sometimes, is there a way to address Ubi by preserving free market principles, open source, decentralization, you know what I yeah, mean? Kind course, of like rebuilding society, if you will. Of course, there are ways to, to, yeah. to um, uh, execute uh, universal basic income in a, a totally like voluntary, privatized way that's uh, um, compatible with libertarian beliefs. Um, if you ask me, though, I think that the, the, the greatest way to do UBI is by like a public private collaboration. You have government UBI and you have private donation UBI all working side by side and all achieving the same effect um, by different means. So I think like the, that's probably what's going to happen. It's going to happen from both ends, right? And that's one of the greatest thing about UBI is like it's it's very attractive to so many different political um, belief systems for different reasons. Because yeah, it's 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 just it's just like put money in people's hands. And that's an attractive, attractive prospect of different people for different reasons, you know? So- I'm Yeah, no, I, I'm just, I just had a flashback of like Bitcoin faucets back when they were a thing, yeah. like in 20, I think 11, 2012, you know, you could just like go to some website and just get some Bitcoin. Yeah. Too bad that's not as feasible, maybe, maybe sometime in the future. Uh, okay, Antoine, was there anything that you, I guess, wish I'd asked that maybe I had, that I didn't? Or no, I, I mean, listen, like, you're very good at, uh, at, uh, you've been very good at asking me the questions that are, like, top of my mind and, and uh, close to my heart. So that's uh, really, like, yeah, I mean, you, you, we, we, you know me. Yeah. If people want to learn more about, I guess, I don't know, you, DevCash or whatever so different things the, that you're working the, on. The DevCash initial bounty offering. Um, What's the website again? Well, uh, the website is bdu.dev. BD, bdu.dev? Yeah. I mean, we're going to change the website later, but that's what we have right now. Oh, okay. Uh, Just like a placeholder. BDU.dev. And then... Uh, Blockchain uh, Developers United. That's our... Are you on Twitter? Uh, not really, no. I have a Twitter, but... Hey, you're also the founder of Bitcoin Bay, yeah, right? Bitcoin. I don't think you talked about that. Do you want to just yeah, yeah. touch on that? Yeah, I wanted to talk that? about Bitcoin Bay, actually, because uh, we were talking about the meetups earlier that were super seminal in our, our community, that we, where we all met. Um, and, and we wanted to um, uh, continue that with Bitcoin Bay. So we took over like the meetups um, reigns from Anthony Diorio, I suppose you could say. Um, also with you, with you, with, with meetups that, that uh, you organized in 2017 and so on. But um, we've been meet, doing meetups every two weeks and, and it's, it's been like a very invaluable uh, meeting place uh, for people. And, and you uh, probably run the longest standing meetups now, right? For yeah, like yeah, some yeah, time yeah, and you guys have been pretty dedicated long, in yeah, Toronto. Yeah, exactly. So that, that's, that's, that's a really honorable thing. And, and, you know, I really appreciate you also being, you know, I think very committed also, to uh, making it very affordable and just like, you know, easy access for people to yeah. come and hang out with other Bitcoiners this, this in Toronto. Also um, developing uh, some um, 
business plans as well for the future. So more announcements coming with that. It's going to have a lot to do with helping Canadian startups and helping uh, Canadian um, like uh, developers and 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 uh, helping Canadian startups succeed. So um, uh, yeah, more on that coming up. If you're in Canada and you want to uh, get in the crypto community, look up Bitcoin Bay and join us and. Uh, We'll, we'll be providing all kinds of helps help for people uh, doing projects in the crypto space in Canada. Um, got it. Got it. In Interesting. Toronto, we have meetups in Toronto. If you're not in Toronto, contact us because uh, we we would love to help you set up uh, meetups in other parts of Canada as well. So, mm. yeah. yeah. No, I, I'm a big believer in. Uh... Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely a big believer of like Bitcoin meetups, you know, these types of meetups, yeah. bringing like minded people together um, is always is always awesome. Anything else, Antoine? Um, you know, I know we covered a lot of ground. I'd be down to do like a jam session with you every every I don't know, like a Bitcoin well, talk type of thing, you know, every couple of weeks or something. If we're going to do a jam session, we should, we should have I'm pretty sure we're gonna get a lot of viewers on this one, man. Like your mom, my mom, <laughs> like I'm sure, yeah, I'm at least really two, happy. three yeah. viewers. Well, well, if, <laughs> if we get two, I'll be Jackson, happy. We should do some some live streaming, doing some interesting stuff, like uh, uh, creating NFT art or something like that. You know? Oh man, sorry, that's so weird that you just said that. Uh, wh why did you say that? Sorry, no, because I was just having a conversation well, earlier NFT today art. about NFTs and all that. Like, what? Can you talk to me a little bit about well, that before NFTs, I let you go? Um, they stand for well, non-fungible tokens right crypto kitties yeah so it's just assets that you can own um i mean typically in 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 the, right now like the assets are attached to an image so it's like oh i own this piece of art or i own this creature or whatever it is um and then you can just trade that and uh in the similar way that you would be able to trade money but except that they're different types so you can't say that this one this art is equal to that art. That's what makes it non-fungible. Um, so, yeah. well, do you think non-fungible tokens have a future? Like, are they? Like, uh, yeah. Well, why? Why? Um, it's, they're just assets. Like, there's pe reasons people. But why would I want to put my art on um, well, the blockchain? Then you can um, you can easily manage the ownership of it. You can you can easily transfer ownership. You can easily prove ownership. Um, when I when I buy a piece of art, also also you could you could, yeah. do, you could do funny things like um, distribute ownership of an art piece. You could say, "Oh, I own." If if move mm. in, what is this this this? It sounds like a movie chord. It's not a movie chord, but um, it's like I want to be able to buy my coffee with uh, shares of the Mona Lisa. <laughs> so imagine the Louvre, famous museum in France, tokenizes the Mona Lisa, and they say, "Hey, we're gonna do like a bit of a sale." You are allowed to now buy like X percentage of the Mona Lisa and invest directly in that art painting. And then if the, the value of it goes up, then the value of your little share would go up too. So technically things like that would be possible. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. Interesting. Yeah, I recently did an interview with uh, with Alan yeah. from Token Funder and he walked us through like a, an interesting you know case um, that they're working on. But anyways, Antoine, what else you got, man? Is that is that good for now or? Um, yeah, but that's is there anything else you want to touch on? Um, I mean, check out the Bitcoin Bay meetups if you're in Canada. Um, check out the DevCash IBO. And um, uh, yeah, so that's it. Cool. All right, man. So we can reconnect again soon. All right. Sounds good. Cool. I'm going to say goodbye. Really